Welcome to the TOPS and FSN Network East and Southern Africa Regional Knowledge Sharing Meeting. My name is Marcia Slater, and I will be serving as the facilitator of the meeting for the next three days. That's a great pleasure for me. We are very excited to have all of you here for these three days of sharing of experiences and perspectives on the changing landscapes of food security, which as you see on the slide is the theme of our meeting. Now to get started, it is my pleasure to introduce a person who needs very little introduction, and that is Mark uh, Fritzler. Mark is the director of TOPS. Having served as TOPS director since its inception in 2010, he's pretty well known. Um, and I believe this, he told me this is his eighth um, knowledge sharing meeting. Is that correct, Mark? Yep, okay. Uh, Mark joined Save the Children in 2003 and served as country director in Iraq, Mozambique, and Indonesia before starting his tenure as director of TOPS. He has a long career in international development and emergency response. Uh, one interesting personal fact that I got out of Mark um, is that when he was in high school and college, he worked as a disc jockey, um, broadcasting on the local radio stations, um, doing news and music. Uh, in fact, he says he still uh, offers his services as a DJ at weddings and bar mitzvahs in case anyone here has a need of that sort of, sort of service, okay? So you can talk to him during a break. Uh, but for now, I'd like to invite Mark up to the podium to welcome all of you to the meeting. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marcia, and, um, and thank you all for coming. I'd like to extend our welcome uh, to you for attending this eighth knowledge sharing meeting we've had, and this, and this is the fourth one we've had in, in Africa. The first one was in Maputo in 2011, followed by Addis Ababa. Then we had a great challenge that we thought I'd take it on, a fully French immersion one in Burkina Faso. Uh, and actually came up quite well. Uh, we had a very good simultaneous translation uh, operation going there in, uh, in uh, Ouagadougou. So um, we're real happy with that, with that, the way that turned out. And we're very happy to be able to come to Uganda to be able to conduct this one. Um, I'd like to welcome all of you for coming here. I'd like to welcome in particular the, um, the NGOs, the implementing pro uh, parties, the people who implement the development assistance programs. I'd like to also welcome academics, those who are representing the various uh, universities. We have representatives from Tulane and Tufts, as well as Makareri University. I, I, I've been asking how to pronounce it. Can you pronounce it here, Makareri or Makareri? Makareri. All right. Uh, McCary University, we also have uh, a large contingent of private sector folks who, uh, who signed up. We hope they, they, they show up. And uh, we particularly are, are pleased to welcome um, representatives from uh, Ugandan government uh, institutions. We're particularly happy to see, see that uh, we've got a good turnout on that. At least we, we hope we're to, they stay throughout the, the four days, or the three days that we have here. So um, again, all of you, all of you welcome. And we hope that you enjoy the opportunity to, um, to meet with one another and to get to know what each other does. Um, to let you know what TOPS is actually, TOPS is, uh, is an acronym for the term Technical and Operational Performance Support Program. Uh, and we never actually use that term, uh, uh, mostly because TOPS is a little easier to remember. Uh, TOPS was um, begun with a, an award from the Office of Food for Peace at USA in um, August of uh, 2010. And we're continuing on now into our uh, moving into our seventh year. Um, we are composed of a consortium led by a consortium um, with the Prime of Safety Children USA, and the four members of the TOPS consortium include uh, Mercy Corps, uh, Tangle International, Food for the Hungry, and the Core Group. And many of those people are all represented here as well. But in addition to which, um, what makes TOPS work really is the fact that it's goes well beyond the consortium, that we've enjoyed the participation and had the opportunity to provide opportunities for uh, all of the, community, the community of practice in, in, in development and food assistance. Um, we, and we've enjoyed the fact that uh, nearly everyone who is engaged in one fashion or another in development has participated in the learning programs that, uh, that we, pro we provide. 
And this, what does TOPS do? Basically, TOPS provides, uh, again, uh, learning spaces where knowledge management and knowledge sharing operation, I view ourselves really as a kind of service program for the development community. And uh, we try to work with the development community to identify the kinds of things that you all would like to know more of or that you already know a fair amount of and would like to share. And then we like to provide you those spaces, those learning spaces, where that information can be laid out, whether it's a, in a training or capacity building environment that has been created, um, uh, custom created in response to needs generated by our polling of the communities uh, who are currently active, uh, or whether it's something that has come up from uh, various other consultative groups. But basically, we try to provide um, learning events and, and subject matter that really speak to your interests and your needs, your, your, your desires and demands. Try to fill in gaps or to help identify new, new tools and new practices and also to try to talk about how those practices seem to be playing out in the field, which is why an event like this is a very good opportunity for uh, many of you to talk about the kinds of uh, tools you've been using and practices you've been using and if they've been effective or not and sharing with others. Uh, we operate um, in, in, in largely kind of a networking fashion. Again, a, an organization like this, 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 this gathering for these three days is a good example of that. We call, in fact, our, the major tool that we use to interact with the development community is called the FSN Network, the Food Security and Nutrition Network. And it is the mechanism by which we reach out to all of you. It's the interactive interface by which uh, the community and the TOPS um, um, representatives and the people who work with TOPS are in, uh, in meeting with one another. And I think most of you probably have gone on to the fsnnetwork.org website. You'll probably notice that there's a fair, a large amount, really, of interactive resources there, as well as a large and growing um, resource library of uh, uh, results, uh, practices, tools, and so on that have been uh, used out in the field. Uh, we've over the over the years that we've been working, we've seen some some real changes, and it came about largely because of the kind of interaction we have had with you. Um, at, uh, at the beginning, I suppose, somewhat naturally, a lot of the work that we were doing, training or uh, learning events, tended to be a bit stovepiped, you know, around you know, nutrition or ag or commodity management. But we're pleased to see that, that in, in the overall um, uh, discipline, that uh, those those barriers, those walls now are really breaking down and nearly every one of our um, uh, uh, concurrent events you'll, you'll notice are really kind of an integrated uh, uh, compendium of work that deals with the you know, gender and nutrition and agriculture and resilience and all the main subject matters that we've been dealing with for the last several years in a sort of a new and, and uh, integrated way. So we're really pleased to see that the dialogue, the conversation, the, the involvement of people like yourselves uh, has helped create, I think, a, a better way to look at, at development and look at the results of development. Um, we also try to maintain a very strong field focus. From the beginning, we've always wanted to aim our, in, our, our efforts and try to involve those people who are functionally, actively on the ground delivering the services. The two main objectives of TOPS is to uh, improve the quality and efficiency of food security programming, and the second one is to help strengthen the skills of those who are delivering those services. And that's all of you, and we do it because we do it together. Um, two things I'm glad to say just as I'm finishing you, that I've been reminded that I should mention is that uh, you'll be hearing more about this, but our ending plenary at the end of these three days, we encourage you to stick around, be uh, participate in that. That's where we do a reflection on the things we've talked about and learned in this event. And we're going to have some, uh, some interesting prizes that will be given out. And Marcia will talk more, a little bit more about that as well. And also, again, you'll also hear about this, that we have a, a social event planned for this evening after the end of this. Um, and you'll be instructed as to where that social event is. And we assume it's not going to rain, but uh, it might. It's a, we, we have a plan B for that. But we encourage you to come and join us. The social event, uh, we'll have snacks and, and, and non-alcoholic drinks from the cash bar. This, after all, is a USA-funded uh, operation, so we don't pay for the drinks, uh, the alcoholic drinks, but you certainly are welcome to use the cash bar and get to know more of your colleagues who come to the event. So again, my welcome to all of you. Thanks so much for coming. 
and we look forward to learning a lot more about you over the next couple of days. Thank you. We're delighted to have Sean Granville Ross as our opening speaker this morning. Uh, Sean, uh, by way of introduction, Sean is in his third year as the country director for Mercy Corps here in Uganda, where he oversees a very large country portfolio and um, supervises a team of 240 staff. Uh, specializing in economic development, Sean has 18 years of experience working in both the private and the nonprofit sectors. And during his 15-year career with Mercy Corps, he has worked in Kosovo. He served as country director in both Mongolia and Indonesia, and was also regional program director in East Asia. So he's been you know, around the globe and back. Uh, in his work here in Uganda, Sean oversees programming that includes economic and market development projects, as well as sustainable rural livelihoods. Interestingly, Sean grew up in neighboring Kenya. Uh, he can talk about that experience some. Uh, he holds a bachelor's degree in agriculture and a master's degree in livestock production. Um, and on a personal note, he's here with his, in Uganda with his family, which includes two children, one girl and one boy. Uh, Sean, thank you so much for opening our meeting and helping us set the climate for learning this morning. Okay, good morning, everybody. As we say in Uganda, you're very most welcome. And so, I wanted to congratulate TOPS, first of all, for choosing the Pearl of Africa as the location for their sharing event. A good choice, especially Ugandans. We are welcome. Welcome, everybody. The shores of Lake Victoria, don't worry about the mosquitoes. They only like the mazungus, all right? So you'll all be okay. I'm sure it's going to be an interesting three days. They told me, set the stage. So, you know, for us, I think the question is, changing landscapes of food security sounds very sort of development, sounds very sort of challenging. So what do we mean? How are we going to share? How are we going to learn? How are we going to take back all of the good knowledge we have and share with our people? Here in Uganda specifically, currently, at least in the Karamoja region, we have about 240,000 people benefiting from Food for Peace assistance. The two large Food for Peace programs up there, and I know a number of sessions in this event, there are colleagues from those programs who are presenting. I'm voting for them. Participate in those meetings. You're gonna learn really good, juicy, exciting stuff. However, you know, even in Karamoja, we still have food, we still have work to do. The most recent food security and nutrition assessment that was conducted by the government and our friends in the UN still cited in June approximately half of all households in Karamoja are still food insecure. However, we still see and we see some bright spots amongst that. Even within the Merciful program, recently we just commit, completed an assessment of our mother care groups and we see 50% of children are receiving a minimum acceptable diet. So I think, you know, for us, the question is, and the broader question for all of us is, how do we bring about changes in behavior? Clearly, people are understanding the issues. How do we encourage people to change behaviors? And how do we think about bringing scale to what we're doing? But more importantly, as we think about the next three days, as we think about the context, what are some of the big challenges, especially in East Africa? Again, if we take Uganda as an example, the statistic that startles everybody here, 75% of our population is under the age of 24. Our population is about 36 million. That means 23 million are under the age of 24. The median age is 15 and a half. I think we're one of the youngest nations in the world. And we have a fertility rate of 6.2. So the rallying call is how are we going to engage youth in our programs? How are we going to get those younger generations engaged and involved? And more specifically, I think it's understanding how we target adolescent girls. I know this is a USAID-funded project, and the USAID mission director here in Uganda is now regularly challenging all of us, how are we going to find and target the 14-year-old girl? So take that note, think about it. It's very difficult, and it's something we have to think about. 
I think the other drivers and trends we need to think about in the context of East Africa, but certainly globally, the issues of urbanization, the rural urban migration. How does that impact our work? How do we think about that? How are we going to address food security, not only in the rural areas, but within the urban areas? Then moving on, another big term we hear regularly talked about, and again in Uganda, we're no stranger to the word, resilience. All right, resilience is there. It's a new way of thinking, a new way of trying to understand the complexities of how we can do development differently. I know everybody's heard about resilience. All of the organizations have their own description, their own analysis. We're all trying to wrestle with it. How do we design programs while we understand the shocks and stresses that are there in our context, the climate variability? But more importantly, I think what resilience is getting us to think about is the complexity of the systems, the interconnected nature of our work. We talk about the social systems, we talk about the ecological systems, and we talk about the economic systems. So again, I think we have to challenge ourselves to think outside the box. Yes, it's food security, but think about those other systems and how they interact and are related to what we do. Moving towards that great big theory, I'm glad to see Tim there, the measurement of resilience. How are we going to measure the impact of our work beyond just food security as we wrestle with the complexities around resilience? There are those absorptive and adaptive capacities, the easier ones, one would say. Transformational capacities, those that work with national government, I think that's where we wrestle. That's something we need to think about. Certainly in the Mercy Corps work, I know our team, we're great at the household level. We do wonderful work with our communities and even with our district and local government. We're struggling with how we engage national government, how we think about those transformational capacities and their impact on enabling us to do our work. Then another thing we need to think about, and again something that I'm sure is going to be presented over the next three days, the role of technology, the role of IT. Just next door is the birthplace of mobile money. Everybody's heard of M-Pesa. Everybody knows about mobile money, but I think it's more than just mobile money now. Certainly, again, right after this session, it's all about cash and vouchers. The development world, the emergency response world, everybody's now talking about technology, cash, vouchers. So I would really challenge us to think about how we embrace and find ways to use technology in our work, in our programming. It's here to stay. Everybody has a smartphone. Everybody's thinking about it. But we have to try and find new ways. So if we're going to think about youth, we're thinking about urban rural migration. We're thinking about resilience. We're thinking about technology. What else do we need to think about? And again, Mark was sort of recognizing the many participants in this room. But I would challenge us to think beyond the general status quo. We're very comfortable in our box as NGOs, as development organizations. But we need to now think about how we're going to take on these big issues, food security and development, with different partners. How are we going to engage the private sector? How are we going to think about engaging our friends in the universities, the research institutions, the think tanks? What are the new models, the new partnerships beyond our very traditional consortiums. How are we going to use those new models and how are we as a development organization, as development workers, going to articulate what we do in a way that's going to engage the private sector and encourage them to join us as we seek ways to achieve greater efficiency, scale, impact, and bring innovation to what we're doing in the work we're trying to do here. So, you know, I think as we continue to think ahead and as we look at the issues around us, it's clear the world is changing fast, the world is ever more interconnected. We are more and more aware of these great shocks and stresses, the risks and vulnerabilities to the vulnerable people we aim to work with. But as we participate in the next three days of sharing knowledge, learning and networking, I think we also need to continue to keep our eyes on what USAID would call CLA, collaborate, learn, and adapt. In Mercy Corps, we talk more about adaptive management. So what is it we need to be able to achieve 
the adaptive management in our work. I think these events are a great step, starting point for some of that thinking, okay? As we think about how do we build the right culture within ourselves and within our teams, to be curious, to look for new ways, to look for new exciting partners, and to think about what we do and try and address these challenges in a different and freshing way. How do we build the skills and the knowledge of our teams and those we work with? Again, this event is all about creating that intentional space, an intentional process to allow people to build skills and share knowledge. How do we enable access to tools and processes that will allow us to succeed? Again, the social media, the use of technology is there. How do we really capitalize on that and use these different tools and processes to allow us to collaborate, to learn and adapt? And then, I think importantly, is recognizing our collective role to champion and to articulate the need for continuing flexibility from our donors. Okay? How do we encourage our donors to be a little bit more flexible, to understand the complexities of our work, and allow us that adaptability as we identify issues, as we see success, and then maybe change the way we do our work. So, you know, let's think about that. Let's think about why we want adaptability, how we're going to do adaptive management, and I'm sure these three days are really going to allow us to begin to think about some of those issues. So in closing, at least in the Mercy Corps world, we often hear our CEO and our leadership talk about the three eyes of leadership, and in order to succeed, we need to champion the three eyes of leadership. The three eyes stand for impact, innovation, and influence. So if we're going to succeed in what we do, how are we going to achieve impact? How are we going to measure our impact? How are we going to articulate our impact? How are we going to be innovative? I know it's an often used word, but we have to find new ways to address the same old issues. And this sort of meeting, this sort of workshop is creating that space for us to think about that. And then finally, how are we going to influence? How are we going to influence beyond our normal stakeholders? How are we going to take what we do to influence national government, to influence our donors, and to influence those partners I talked about? So if there's just one thing, think about those three eyes of leadership as you move around those meetings, as you share, and as you network. And in the meantime, I wish you a good meeting. I'll be here. I'm looking forward to it. And I'm sure you'll enjoy the hospitality of Uganda. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sean. I, I want to point out that Sean will be uh, attending the, the entire three days of the meeting, so you'll have lots of opportunities to meet and greet him, you know, on a one-on-one -on -one basis, be with him in the meetings, and, um, and sort of get more of, of this perspective that he's offered us this morning. We appreciate your excellent stage set. It's now my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for today, um, Joyce Luma. Joyce is uh, the country director for the World Food Program in South Sudan, uh, of a capacity that she's held since June 2014. Um, as you might guess, uh, the World Food Pro Program's um, operations in South Sudan are one of the largest they have. And uh, in, in fact, it includes um, over 950 staff. Uh, Joyce manages these very complex operations, which at their peak include um, six, 600 to 800 trucks running every day, um, and during the rainy season they have somewhere around uh, four, 40 flights per day carrying passengers, cargo, and doing airdrops. So just to give you, you know, an idea of, of what, you know, she needs to, to manage and, and oversee and, um, and ensure the success of. Um, in her previous work before um, this particular uh, uh, assignment with the World Food Program, Joyce developed an indicator called the Food Security Score, which is now an indicator for tracking food consumption adequacy in assessments conducted by the World Food Program and its partners. Um, I asked Joyce for a couple of ideas, of, you know, some information um, on a personal note, and she wrote me that she's the seventh child of nine children. Um, she has two college-going children, and she's an avid runner. 
which she says um, is not so easy uh, to do uh, when you're living in a compound in, in Juba. Uh, she said it's like running in a cage some days just to make it to the 10 kilometer mark. So um, we're very pleased to have you with us today, uh, Joyce, and uh, invite you to the podium. Thank you. inviting me to speak here today on this topic, changing landscape for food security, changing these landscapes on uh, food security. It's a privilege for me to be asked to take part in a talks regional meeting for Southern, Central and Eastern Africa. I have previously uh, participated in a talks uh, meeting, I believe, the very first one in Baltimore, which was a global meeting. So I'm therefore very, very happy to participate in this one, just closest to me. <clears throat> Last year, at the UN summit, heads of states and governments formally adopted the Sustainable Development Goals. And these goals are interrelated. Goal number two, commits all countries to end hunger and reduce all forms of malnutrition. The selection of these goals took into account all the most significant global changes that are shaping businesses, trade, societies, and indeed food security and nutrition. By 2030, these shifts will have been so significant and we have changed the way we, we do our work. The execution of the 2030 Agenda, as it is called, the Plan of Implementation, therefore calls for the recognition of these global shifts. We need to understand the challenges and the opportunities that emerge in order for us to be able to design programs that will enable successful achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. The Agenda 2030 therefore requires that we change the way we work to enable design programs that address these emerging challenges. So, what are these changes and how are they going to impact our region? And how are these changes in particular affecting food security activities in this region? And what action does the food security community need to take to enable contribute to the global commitment to achieving zero hunger and ending malnutrition? I will focus my discussion on the major mega trends that are impacting the food security landscape in Africa. And these, these changes are primarily demographic changes uh, which are impacting on the age structure growing uh, elderly population, youth, unemployment, conflict, urbanization, climate change, and innovation. So let me start by looking at the demographic changes. The world population is expected to increase by 1 billion by 2050. Africa will contribute to about 50% of that increase peaking at 1.6 billion by 2030. And globally, falling fertility rates and high life expectancy will increase the proportion of the elderly. In Africa, on the other hand, fertility rates decline have been slow. And in many countries, they have stagnated, and as a result, Africa continues to have a fast-growing population. By 2030, the average life expectancy in Africa will increase to 64 years, up from 57 in 2010. If you compare globally, 8% um, of the population is above 
65% now and will swell to 13% by 2030. Africa will have just about a third of its population above 65 in 2030. About 4.5% of its population will be above 65 in 2030. However, the original differences are in the population the proportion of the population that are above 65. East Africa will have uh, significantly high life expectancy compared to other regions. But also there are some countries that will have an elderly population. The greatest increase in the elderly population are uh, South Africa, which will have about, which will comprise about 14% of the elderly population in Africa. Others, that will have high elderly population are Botswana, Zimbabwe, and Djibouti. I'm not sure why Djibouti, but Djibouti will have uh, quite a high proportion of the elderly. And of course, you know, East Africa will have, uh, in, the, in, in Africa will have a high concentration of uh, the elderly population. Now, the elderly population has special needs, which African countries will have to consider. Pension systems, are not in place and therefore social protection systems will need to address the needs of the elderly. Also, health, health systems will need to consider care due to the physical and mental disabilities as well as the chronic conditions of the elderly population. So the question I ask is, is whether social safety nets are in place to support the growing numbers of the elderly in countries we work and also, how are we targeting these groups to address their special needs? Now, one group that's growing in Africa is, is, is the youth. The continued high fertility rates means that Africa will continue to have a large young population, as well as adding more people than most countries. The fertility rates have remained particularly high in countries like DRC, Nigeria, Niger, Malawi, Mozambique, and Chad. Some declines in fertility have occurred for Kenya, Ethiopia, Rwanda, Liberia, and Central African Republic, but these have stagnated. By 2050, the median age for Africa will be about 25 years. This means that Africa will have a young population who continue to have a young population that needs to enter the labor market. About seven to 10 million young people are entering the labor market each year. The majority with inadequate skills while at the same time facing all job opportunities. Many will be employed in low productivity sectors, particularly in the informal sector or agriculture, and therefore they will have inadequate income. Studies show a strong correlation between youth unemployment and violence. About 80% of civil conflict of affected countries are in countries with young populations. The driver is not just about, it's not just having the young population, but rather high unemployment among the youth. The Arab Spring was a result of high youth unemployment. A young man in Tunisia working in the informal sector was disillusioned and set himself on fire and that triggered the Arab Spring for a number of countries. We've seen violence and ter terrorism in northern Nigeria that could be linked to youth unemployment. That's not necessarily driven by religion, they say. In Somalia, we saw young men were recruited to conduct piracy as a form of employment. Election violence in, in Kenya was carried out by discontent youth who were manipulated by politicians. Similarly, xenophobia violence in Southern Africa is again committed by youths on the streets who are not fully engaged and, and, and see migrants as the ones who are taking their jobs. But let me just talk a little bit about South Sudan and the conflict there and the youth and how uh, what we see in South Sudan would be not far-fetched 
in other countries if we don't manage the youth issue. In South Sudan, civil conflict has been perpetrated through the use of young unemployed youth, young militias such as the White Army. South Sudan has a high and fast growing youth population. 70% of the population are under the age of 30. Many have little education, they neither read nor write. Underemployment and unemployment is extremely high, and their source of wealth and income is kept already. In a study conducted by Oxfam, the youth claimed that they had no access to education, no economic opportunities. They consider some form of gender-based violence acceptable. South Sudan has many organized youth groups. The White Army estimated at 25 to 30,000 youths. The Jeowen or Dinka youth again estimated at 35 to 40,000 youths. The Mumole youths about 20,000. They are the Arrow Boys and several other youth groups. These youth groups have a common feature. They are militia, are independent, and have no respect for authority, whether traditional or formal. In South Sudan, of course, their uh, primary concern is the warfare of their, their cattle. We've seen that the white army have prominently uh, featured in a number of civil wars in South Sudan, uh, and they've been a source of instability during the transitional and independence period, as well as currently. The challenge, therefore, is how, how to keep the youth fully engaged in productive activities so that they have adequate aims and are not engaged in violence. They have been largely excluded in education and economic activities and are exploited by politicians and the local leaders. Conflict is a key driver to food insecurity and a major contributing factor to a large increase in the numbers of hungry population. We've seen that in Syria, we've seen that in South Sudan, we've seen that now in Libya, Nigeria. Now, if we don't manage this, you know, uh, we'll see many parts of many parts of Africa, I need to say, are at risk of violence and conflict due to growing inequality and lack of inclusiveness and economic engagement among the youth. So how do we engage the youth? Last year, WFP and Oxfam began, this is in South Sudan, WFP and Oxfam South began working with youth, youth groups in one of the areas to engage them in productive economic activities to raise the opportunity cost for them to be mobilized for military campaigns. Through a participatory and consultative uh, uh, approach, the youth outline the activities that they'll be interested in to, uh, interest them to work and agree on a seasonal livelihood action plan. They also identified uh, trainings that they were interested in, and these were just a range of training. We have over 8,000 youths that are currently engaged in this program. Mexico, work in South Sudan on market-driven youth program, is one of the best practice, practices in youth engagement. The program is informed by market assessment that is undertaken to determine the value chain of the local economy. The market analysis identifies existing and emerging formal and informal livelihood opportunities and the absorptive capacity of the local market, which become the basis of skills building component of the program. Thus, skills enhanced are not imposed on the youth, but they are based on uh, those that are identified by the, by the youth. We believe that the life of programming that focus on both labor supply and the demand of the labor market tend to be more promising. So, a question in moving forward is whether we have adequate skills for analyzing youth issues and designing and managing programs that are responsive to their needs. How inclusive are our programs? And by the way, 
the youth are not readily drawn to food assistance type of, of programs unless such programs uh, can fully engage them or provide them skills that will result in productive activities. We need to engage the youth in humanitarian recovery and development activities. This may mean setting clear targets for their inclusion and planning for support to enable design youth sensitive programs. Another major um, trend is urbanization. By 2030, half of the world's population will be living in urban areas. Post 2030, there will be more people living in urban areas than in rural areas in Africa. Most of the population growth will take place in nine countries. Uh, and not surprising, um, much of this will be in countries that already have the highest uh, uh, population. And, and this will be India, Nigeria, Pakistan, which already have large, large population. But next to uh, these uh, countries in this region, DRC, Ethiopia, Tanzania, and Uganda, which will have quite uh, a large urban population. Urbanization in Africa is primarily due to rural urban migration, but as well as uh, population growth, uh, natural, natural growth. So population growth itself will contribute to increased needs of food across the world. More food will need to be produced for the growing population. Urban population, as we saw in the 2000, uh, 2007 uh, food crisis, are worst affected by production shortfalls and the subsequent uh, rising prices. Analysis of data of 10 countries in Southern Africa found six out of 10 countries to have higher energy deficits consumed in consumption among the urban population compared to the rural population. In all countries in Africa, except for Kenya and Uganda, at least 40% of the urban population are energy deficit consuming. Ethiopia has about 90% of its urban population consuming energy deficit diets. Malawi, 76, and Zambia, 72. In 2007-2009, we saw growing food insecurity in urban areas as a, res as a result of rising food, fuel, and the financial crisis, which put to life discussions about urban food insecurity, as well as the use of cash as a response. There was also recognition that urban food security exists because most of the data tend to uh, compare, uh, tend to mask uh, the urban food insecurity problem because uh, there they are comparisons at all times between rural and urban. And so once data are compared between rural and urban, and we tend to see that you know, urban food insecurity is lower. And so the discussion tends to be very rural focused. And so for the first time, um, as a result of the food and fuel crisis, there was a lot more discussions about urban uh, food insecurity and also the recognition that um, rural-based interventions are not best suited to addressing urban food insecurity. Um, and, uh, particularly for countries that have high urban uh, growth and functioning markets. There was also a realization that we must look outside agriculture for a large proportion of the population for a number of countries. Cash is the primary source of food in urban areas, and not necessarily agriculture. Yet, most of the, most of the food security analysis conducted by agent, agencies tend to be rural focused. And as the world's rural population begins to shrink and the urban growth takes over, there is need to look outside agriculture for solutions for urban, solutions for urban uh, food insecurity. Cash-based interventions, cash-based cash transfers have steadily, steadily grown over the years since 2007 uh, uh, crisis when there was a large scale up 
in response to the food and fuel crisis. USAID provides, USA provides a large amount of cash for food assistance in support of market-based approaches, including support of local and regional procurement of food and cash, uh, of food and cash and voucher, and cash and voucher transfers. In 2010, uh, USAID provided 300 million uh, US dollars for this purpose. We saw last year grants of over 1 billion were provided for cash transfers as well as local and regional procurement that included support to the Ebola. On the, on the humanitarian side, uh, WFP cash transfers rose from 1.1 million beneficiaries in 2000 to 9.59 million in 2015. In 2060, WFP, for example, uh, has uh, cash transfers that are taking place in 54 countries out of the 84 countries uh, we work in. Cash are increasingly dispersed by social protection and for poverty reduction and to buy food from the protection of civilian side and, and we had to stop providing cash and switch back to, to uh, in-kind. It's not so easy to do the switches uh, between in-kind uh, 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 cash uh, and in-kind uh, 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 assistance. Let me talk about climate change as a major uh, as a major change that will impact food security. We see climate change uh, is going to have the biggest threat to food security and nutrition, particularly here in Africa, and also has a threat to the achievement of the sustainable development goals. Estimates show that climate shifts will increase hunger and child malnutrition by about 20% by 2050. What causes the havoc, rather, is the variability, the irregular patterns that are happening more frequently and with greater intensity. Rainfall patterns are changing and seasons are shifting and affecting crop production. Some areas will heat up and flood and yet others will be affected by both uh, floods and drought and we've seen that with the recent uh, El Nino. Africa will experience the biggest impact of climate change. About 80% of the food insecure households in Africa live uh, in countries that are prone to natural disasters. Africa has a high number of countries that are arid to semi-arid, and it is projected that the semi-arid land areas will increase by between 5 to 8 percent by 2080. Scientists also warn that temperatures in Africa will likely continue to rise faster than other parts of the world, particularly in the arid regions. Therefore, Africa is particularly vulnerable, more so because of um, most farming is uh, rain-fed. 90%, 95% of the farming area is rain-fed. So climate change is likely to cause shorter growing seasons. Therefore, farmers will need to be aware of these changes as some crops are sensitive to changes in temperatures. Livelihood systems will have to change. Uh, pastoral systems could become even more viable in, uh, in some of the areas that used to be uh, 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 in some, some of those areas where crops were grown and crop production severely undermined as productive farming land declines. Not all countries will be affected in the same way. Rainfall will decrease in the southern Africa and increase in eastern Africa. Water sources will be affected as well with some rivers drying up water will become more scarce due to rising population and subsequent in increased use. Poor management of groundwater is also resulting in dropping of water tables. About half a billion people face chronic water shortages now across the world. And these shortages, uh, and the population that will face water shortages, and next we manage 
and the water resources will might swell to 4 billion by 2050. According to analysis by Maplecroft, changing weather patterns are affecting agriculture, food insecurity, migration, and stability, and the combination of these would lead to uh, instability in most of the countries. Not all is wrong as Africans need uh, not to reinvent the wheel. There's a lot to choose from and adapt to the African context from the developed world. Uh, mobile telephones and the social media have opened up Africa. More information is shared as a result of uh, uh, technology. Markets are greatly, uh, have greatly improved in, in many locations. For example, we've seen in Somalia, which has very few uh, functioning banks, uh, is one of uh, the largest recipient of remittances. And how is that done without the banking uh, systems? Uh, mobile phones have replaced the banks. More than 50% of the population have mobile subscription, and 40% of the adults have mobile accounts, thus making it easy for cash transfers and receiving remittances. This in turn is boosting economic activities in towns such as Mogadishu. Use of technology and climate smart inputs could help address the irregular rainfall patterns. Science advances makes it possible for drought and heat tolerant crops, which will enable farmers adapt to changing weather uh, patterns. Adaptation will reduce the risk to these changes but we need to be integrated with mitigation and strategies. In 2010, the international community, the international community promised to provide 100 billion US dollars per year by 2020 to help developing countries adapt to climate impacts. Only a small, only a small amount of this funding has been displaced. Many countries will require technical support in accessing these funds and designing and managing the resilience building programs. Early warning systems can also help protect communities from extreme weather. Uh, communities need advanced information to better plan and manage their activities. The digital tools will also make it easier to share information on focus, thus enabling farmers to better manage the changes. There are also several innovative tools and strategies for reducing and mitigating risks that address food insecurity and enhance uh, resilience. For instance, there are focus-based approaches that are contributing to changing the humanitarian systems, enabling any action by providing for faster preparedness and response prior to the onset of, of the crisis, and at the same time, advancing funds for resilience building activities. These initiatives are changing the traditional response mechanism through community action level before climatic shock and complementing existing emergency response mechanisms and resilience building post disaster recovery. Finally, quite a lot of investment has been made and but is still needed to help communities build resilience and reduce uh, risk. A lot of good work has been done, has undertaken during the last, work, last few years. On, uh, a lot of work has been done on different aspects of resilience building during the last few years. And that has incorporated adaptation, disaster risk reduction, conflict preve prevention, peace building, and so forth. Looking ahead, Changes will continue taking place, and some of these changes could destabilize the world. However, we are more than well placed to manage these changes. We need to understand these changes, and we need to be able to manage these changes effectively. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joyce, um, for your 
very thorough analysis of the opportunities and challenges um, that characterize this changing landscape of food security. We really appreciate you posing the difficult questions that we have three days now to deliberate and um, very much appreciate the thoughtful presentation. Uh, one thing in my haste to establish uh, Joyce's uh, reputation as an incredible leader of a, of a very complex humanitarian operation, I sort of overlooked her technical credentials and I wanted to just go back and underscore those. Um, Joyce holds a, uh, a doctorate in food and nutrition with a minor in agricultural economics from Texas Tech University, as a matter of fact. And Joyce is a native of Zambia. So I just wanted to wrap up with a little bit more information on her. Joyce will be with us for the duration of the day, so um, we invite you to um, try to find some more time to talk to her and um, uh, you know, sort of pick her brain on some of these um, issues that she raised in her uh, keynote address this morning. So, oh yeah, she'll also be at the social this afternoon, or this evening. So, um, yeah, that's great. We'll have um, some quality time with both of our speakers. Uh, so, I would like to ask for one more round of applause for them before they leave the podium. <laughs>